Welcome. Okay. We are. Welcome. <laughs> we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. But hopefully we won't have that horrible echo sound anymore. I'm Charmaine Tanner, and we're going to be talking all about functional behavior assessments today, otherwise known as FBAs. Um, I've had parents recently ask me different questions about functional behavior assessments. I've been reading some this fall that have been coming in. And it's like, what is really a good functional behavior assessment? Um, as a parent, if your child has behavior challenges, um, the school will often say, well, let's do an FBA. They should, one, get your consent before they do that. Um, but once they do the functional behavior assessment, sometimes you hardly see any kind of report from that. And instead, you'll just see the behavior plan that is generated um, based on their functional behavior assessment. So today, we're going to be talking about what should be in a quality functional behavior assessment and actually how we can help them, um, these assessments, be really more meaningful for you and for the teachers working with your child. Um, because oftentimes, functional behavior assessments can be like other test scores and other things that they do. It's like, this is not really helpful. So we want to prevent that problem. We want um, to get good information that's going to help your child. So one of the um, slides that I have here is what we usually see um, when people are doing the functional behavior assessment. So let me bring this up here. It says the four common functions uh, of behavior, and they have this little mnemonic device, and it says everybody eats. And so they want you to know that E stands for escape, a stands for attention, um, T stands for tangible, and S stands for sensory. So most of the time, um, you're going to have an FBA, and they're going to come up with a function of the behavior. And they're going to say, you know, the function of the behavior is to get attention, or the function is to escape. The function is to get a tangible reward or the function is um, to meet a sensory need. And so what I want you to do is when you um, see their hypothesis of what they think the function of the behavior is, is I want you to ask why. So I want you to say, why do we think my child is trying to escape this task? Or why do we think my child is trying to get attention? Why do we think he's trying to get a tangible reward? Why do we think he's trying to get a sensory need met? Because I think that function is not enough. So I almost, I guess, <laughs> Um, I would like to change the whole name of that because to me, when we come up with this result, like, oh, the child's just trying to get attention. And then we have this whole behavior plan written and we're not really sure of the underlying reason of why your child is trying to get attention. So ask why, 
make sure that we talk about what that underlying message is. So for instance, if a child, um, they say that the function of the behavior is for your child to escape or um, escape during the work or avoid during the work, we want to know why, right? Because there can be several underlying messages. And we all know that behavior is sending us a message, right? It's communicating. Well, we got to figure out what that underlying message is. For students that, you know, are refusing to do the work, you know, pushing it off their desk, you know, folding their hands and saying no, we want to know why. Is it because the work is too easy? And that can happen, especially when your child's being asked to do something that they've been doing for months. And it's like, I'm at my breaking point. I'm not going to keep doing this anymore for you. So if the work is too easy, that might be why they're trying to avoid the work or the opposite. Maybe the work is too hard and they want to avoid doing the work. Maybe they're trying to tell us with their behavior. I've been working really hard, you know, for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and I just need a break here. So depending on what the underlying message is, that helps us figure out what ways we can support your child better. And then we can get a better behavior plan in place for your child. So Jean is with us. And Jean, let me take this one off here. Um, And Jean says, often I hear that the underlying reason is it's a non-preferred task. And that's a pretty common um, response to um, parents that say, well, why do you think he's doing this? So again, I would want to go a little bit deeper and try to get clarifying information. So, you know, when you ask, why do you think he's avoiding work? And then they give you the answer because it's a non-preferred task. And then I want you to follow up with another why. Why do we think this is a non-preferred task? And stop and give them time to give you an answer. Now, Jean, so why do you think your child, you know, so maybe, Jean, if you could identify in the comment box, like, what you think are some non-preferred tasks of your child at school. And then, you know, let's have a back and forth here on our live show, and we'll talk about why we think that's non-preferred for him. Um, so, so cool. This is, like, um, interesting. So, also, um, Venus is saying, me too, unwanted task. <laughs> and Lisa is saying, me too. <laughs> so cool. We have some, <laughs> some common thing that we can talk about here today. So that's great. Um, so Jean says that it's a non-preferred task when he has to do handwriting because it's very challenging. So instead of seeing this as a behavior issue that your child has to fix and change. If we know it's because it's handwriting and it's challenging, then what we can say is, well, let's look at the accommodations in the IEP. Do we have appropriate accommodations to help when he has to do something, you know, with handwriting? Um, So Jean, if you can tell us, you know, what kinds of accommodations are written in his IEP for handwriting, because if they're not implementing the accommodations, then that's going to cause, you know, some inappropriate behavior, some refusal to do the work. And so it's not really a behavior issue. It's really an accommodation issue. And it's follow through on the staff. So, um Let's talk about that for a little bit. So let me know what kinds of accommodations he has for handwriting. So Venus says, yes, not being taught the way they learn. And that's like a huge thing, right? So again, sometimes it can be helpful to have that functional behavior assessment, have them define the function of escaping or avoiding work, and then have a conversation like, 
So maybe instead of a behavior plan, maybe we need to go back to the IEP and look at what kinds of supports and services we're giving. Are we helping him learn through the best channels for the type of learner that he is? Um, and Venus says that many of, let's see, many of her son's behavior issues in school are due to frustrations. Exactly. Um, and that's why we need to have a more in-depth conversation about behavior. Um, because I often see it as adults need to change their behavior and then we'll see the students being more successful. So, you know, it's not like we can actually say in an IEP meeting, maybe the teacher needs a behavior plan, <laughs> even though that's what we're thinking, right? Um, and so, again, it's kind of like we need to move this conversation to how do we provide supports so we're teaching him the way he learns. So if it's a handwriting issue that, you know, we allow him to use the computer or we use, um, you know, speech to text kind of software, there's other things that we can be doing. So, um, <laughs> Ansley is like, amen. Yes. So Jean says he is seven. So I hear that he needs to work on handwriting. So he doesn't really have accommodations for it at this point. So that's a concern. Um, if that's a challenge for him, my guess is, Gene, he's got some kind of IEP goal um, around handwriting, if that's like a real kind of struggle for him. I don't know if he's also getting... Um, you know, school services from an occupational therapist. If that occupational therapist can have some consultation time with the general ed teacher so they can be working on, you know, how do we help the child during the day? Um, and let me see if I missed anything here. Uh, Yes, so Venus is also saying one of the reasons is no differentiation. Um, and that can that can really um, totally be a reason. So our kids are communicating to us that um, this is not easy for me. This is not how I learn. Um, and if they do have a behavior plan, then what you want to do is make sure the prevention strategies in the behavior plan are we use accommodations to give supports. Um, we make sure that um, we're using, you know, teaching methods that align with their learning strengths. So if you wind up with a behavior plan, the really important part of it is going to be the first part of the behavior plan where you talk about prevention strategies. Um, but if we take a step back and we look at the FBA, um, the Functional Behavior Assessment, so one of the things that rarely gets done is for the person, and sometimes it's the psychologist or the special ed teacher, to actually spend time talking to the parents. So, Venus, I know you had mentioned that your son has a behavior plan. Um, Jean, I don't know if your son or daughter has a behavior plan, if you can let us know. But when they were doing the functional behavior assessment, Venus, did you ever get um, the person to actually sit down with you as a parent and, um, and talk much with you? Because to me, that's one of those um, qualities of a well done, um, functional behavior assessment is that they actually have time to sit and talk with the parent and not just send him a questionnaire for you to fill out, but actually either have a face-to-face -face or um, a phone call where you actually get to talk about, I think this is what <laughs> my child is trying to tell us. Um, 
because that information and that context that you have as a parent is like super important for the person who's doing the FBA to use. So I'm going to see, I have um, some slides here on uh, PowerPoint and I don't know, for some reason, we'll see if we can pull them up. But um, so besides adding the parent interview to a behavior, um, a functional behavior assessment. The other thing that I look for is when they're doing their, um, the FBA, do they really talk about the frequency of the behavior, the duration of the behavior, which is how long it lasts, and the intensity, so how severe is it? So sometimes teachers will say, well, the student is never following directions. And that word never. <laughs> when the person is doing the functional behavior assessment, they should be able to tell really how frequently it's happening. And the only way they can do that is if they're in the classroom doing some observations. So um, let me just... For some reason, my slides don't want to come up, so we use the agenda here. Um, so for sure, we want the person conducting the FBA to have more than one observation of your child in the schoolroom, um, in the classroom. You know, if it's the general ed class, if it's, you know, out on the recess where the problems are happening, we want some observations and we want it at different times. So we want like morning and afternoon observations, probably more than just the classroom. You know, maybe also in the special ed room, we want an observation or when they're going to, you know, art, music or PE, you want to get a good picture of how the child is interacting in a lot of different ways in a lot of different settings, because when we observe kids, and we see, you know, when they go to music class, they have no problems following the teacher's directions. And then it's like, okay, now we got to figure out what makes music class different than the general ed class. Why is your child following directions in music class? And it might be because the music teacher, you know, just gives one direction at a time. Or it might be because the music teacher allows kids to move and, you know, change positions and they're not having to sit in the desk. It might be because the music teacher has a lot of visuals that they'll point to. So when they're doing observations for the functional behavior assessment, hopefully they're observing times when your child is doing well. And then as a detective, we have to figure out why did it go well there how can we replicate this? How can we make sure it also happens in the general ed room? Um, so the observations are going to be um, very important. And um, Jen says that, yes, um, he's getting services OT, PT, and SLP. So Jen, what you might do is um, talk to the OT and say, you know, when he has handwriting in the classroom, has to, you know, write things in the classroom, it's really becoming a frustration. And now he's starting to, um, you know, act inappropriately. The teachers are concerned with this. What tips do you have that you can give the classroom teacher? Um, because, you know, it kind of stems from, they're asking him to do something that's hard for him to do handwriting. And instead of being preventive and proactive, they're kind of letting him melt down. And then they're like, oh, look at all these behavior problems. It's because we asked him to do a non-preferred task. Well, we not only asked him to do a non-preferred task, but we're not giving him the right supports. So he can be successful with something that's not what he loves to do. 
Um, so I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, Cynthia has written in our keyword. She knows um, the word is matrix because I have a, um, I just really like it. It's, and you know, for some reason, I don't know why my, uh, my PowerPoint isn't showing. It keeps telling me I need to add a Chrome extension, which I did. Um, but for some reason, it's not bringing it up. But I have this really cool matrix. And down the left side of it are all the different things that a child could be communicating. Like, um, I need a break. No one's listening to me. Um, I need help. You're giving me too much help. <laughs> so there's this long list of all the possible things that your child could be communicating. And then across the top of the matrix are some of the behaviors that you might see. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got this cold. Let me get a drink. So what I like about it is so many times when... Um, we read functional behavior assessments, you know, the reports that they've um, written up after they've, you know, completed their assessment is that they'll say, well, you know, the student, you know, pushed all the things off their desk. <coughs> I think I'm going to have to get a throat lozenge. Um, and they kind of leave it at that. And the teacher's like, yeah, that's what, you know, is disrupting everybody's learning when they keep knocking everything off their desk when I ask them to do their handwriting assignment. Um, and instead, we need to say, well, what was that child trying to communicate to us when they knocked everything off their desk? <coughs> um, so if you'd like to get a copy of that matrix. It's called a communication um, intent matrix. Just um, type the word matrix into the comments. And then my magical IEP bot should respond to you and give you the link for that uh, matrix. And when our show is done today, I can go back in and, and make sure that you have that link. Um, so let me see if I've missed any other questions or comments. So um, let's see here. So Tatiana says, my son gets very anxious and so worried when he struggles in school. <clears throat> but because he has no bad behaviors, they don't um, think he needs a behavior plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and this is kind of that fine line of, is a behavior plan going to really help? Or is it going to hinder? Um, and... Sometimes it's only kids that do acting out kinds of behaviors that get noticed and that the teacher will say, wow, you know, look what he's doing. We need to make sure that, you know, we figure something else out. The kids that are more withdrawn and that are feeling more anxious and worried, but they internalize it and the teachers don't see any acting out behavior. Sometimes that gets ignored. So when you're at your IEP meeting um, in October, Tatiana, that would be for sure something that you want to discuss um, and say, you know, it could be, you know, for some kids, it's like they want to do everything perfectly. And when they get anxious about like, am I going to be able to do this assignment perfectly? They spend so much time redoing it, redoing it. It's like, you know, it never gets turned in or they don't get credit for it. So you need to explain different examples of what's happening with your son 
So um, when you're at the IEP meeting, you can talk about that. And again, you know, depending on the types of accommodations that are in the IEP, the accommodations could provide the support that he needs um, without having a behavior plan. Um, but if you think a behavior plan would be helpful, then you can bring that up. Usually what they're going to do is want to do that functional behavior assessment before they write any behavior plan. Um, that for sure that would be a discussion that you can have at the IEP meeting. So we've talked about um, that when they come up with a function of your child's um, behavior, that just identifying, you know, that they're trying to escape the task isn't enough, that instead you have to be asking why. Because what we want to try and do is get to that underlying message that your child is communicating through their behavior. One of the ways that they can figure that out is to observe in many different um, places. But another thing that needs to happen is that they um, take data. And this should be... Um, you know, objective kinds of data that they're taking. And some of the data, you want them to be able to identify how often the behavior happens, so the frequency of it, how long the behavior lasts. So if they're refusing to do work, you know, does that last for, you know, two minutes and then they get back to it? Or... Do they avoid it for the rest of the class period? So the duration is, you know, 30 minutes. I mean, that makes a big difference. That's important for us to know. And then the third thing that you want the data to show is the intensity of the behavior. So, you know, do they just put their head down and ignore you and, you know, they're quiet, but they just won't do it? Or is the behavior more intense and they you know, start throwing things or yelling or crying or, you know, stomping their feet or something. Um, so the data should actually show you three different things, the frequency, the duration, and the intensity. Um, and that can be um, really important. So let me see. So Terry is saying that Z has one. So, um and Terry, I don't know how how appropriate you think Z's behavior plan is. And when you meet in October for your meeting, if that's something else that um, you want to look at. And Tatiana says, but the anxiety towards the end of the year, it's almost like depression and withdrawal. And um, that's something that you for sure want to um, bring to the team's attention. Because as a parent, we can pick up and notice those things with our children. And sometimes the teachers at school don't see those signs that we see. Um, and so for sure, that's a conversation that you want to have. And you you know, and I know, Tatiana, one of your goals is to have so much of a better year this year than what happened last year, because you don't want your son going through the whole school year and feeling unsuccessful and to the point where they're getting depressed and withdrawn about it. Um, those are major red flags, and we want to make sure the staff is aware of that um, and that he's getting the supports and the services that he needs so he can feel successful. Um, that would be like super important. Um, she also says that, or sometimes her son can um, be OCD, have that obsessive compulsive kind of, you know, disorder. 
and that we experienced that for some time, which was horrible. And yeah, I mean, again, depression, withdrawal, OCD, all of those things um, need to be addressed by the IEP team. And sometimes um, it, it's up to us as parents to help the teachers understand what that looks like. So if you can say, if you notice my son doing this, putting his head down or asking to go to the bathroom a lot or, you know, not, not answering any questions in class or, you know, whatever the behaviors are that you know are kind of like signals that your son is starting to withdraw, share that information with the team. Because for teachers, it can be like they have to work with a student for a number of weeks before they even notice something like that. So that's something that we want to share with them at the beginning of the year and have them keep an eye out for because that's something that needs to be addressed. And if it's not in his current IEP, you know, when you have your meeting, for sure, that's something that you would um, want to have in his IEP so he gets those services. Um, Mindy is with us. Hey, Mindy, thanks for being here. She said, our FBA was done over several months, large, largely by my son's main life skills teacher. The BIP, which is the Behavior Intervention Plan, is used to have specific protocols across teachers and settings to help them get back on track. Still new to us, and I'm not sure how effective it's been. So it sounds like, Mindy, that um, if your FBA was done over several months, um, that they were, you know, gathering um a lot of good information. What you want to do maybe is if you didn't get a written report from the person that did the FBA is to ask for that report um, because you want to make sure you understand the information that they captured and then make sure when you look at a copy of the behavior intervention plan that what they learn from the FBA is really incorporated into the behavior plan. You want to make sure there's that connection. So when they did the FBA, if they figured out times of the day or subjects that your child did well in, do they have that figured out like, ah, this is what made the difference. You know, he came in, he had a visual schedule on his desk. He was really, really successful. So then in the behavior plan under the prevention strategies, you want to make sure I have a visual schedule on his desk is one thing that we notice when he has that things go so much better. Um, so what you want to do is, um, Mindy, look at the FBA, see what that written report says go back and kind of compare it with the behavior plan. The other thing that you can do is if this was something that's, you know, kind of new this school year is to, you know, see if you can have, you know, it depends, maybe daily or weekly communication with the teachers. So you do get feedback and see, does this behavior plan work? You don't want weeks and weeks to go by and then learn later when you get his first progress report that, you know, he's still having, you know, inappropriate behaviors and the teacher is still frustrated. You want to find that out early. <laughs> so then if you need to tweak or amend the behavior plan that you get a chance to do that. Um, so that would be really good to know. Um, and Mindy also says that she would like the matrix. So hopefully when you type that in, you got a response from my um, automatic messenger. And I'll check at the end of the show if you didn't to make sure that you can um, get that in. Tatiana also wants the matrix form. So yes, um, 
hopefully you're getting that response and Terry wants it. <laughs> Ansley wants it. Lisa and Donna is with us. Hey, Donna. So um, she also wants a communication matrix. And like I said, I think it's a really helpful document. Um, I remember when I was um, a new special ed teacher and there was a student in my class and whenever we would sit on the floor, Joey was his name and he would always like kick the kid in front of him <laughs> and the kid in front of him, of course, would get upset and turn around and, you know, there'd be this verbal argument. But what I figured out was Joey didn't have the verbal skills yet to say hi or do you want to play with me or let's be friends. And so what he would do is kick the student in front of him to get attention. The student would turn around and look at him and Joey would just like, have this big smile like, hey, <laughs> this person noticed me. So instead of saying, oh, this is a horrible behavior, Joey kicks kids in class. Instead, I saw it as Joey needs to figure out how to be friends, how to tell kids hi, or, you know, let's sit together or whatever he was trying to tell him. So, you know, I could have said, you know, oh, Joey just wants to get attention, you know, and how are we going to stop that? Because that's not appropriate. So I'm going to keep track of how many times he kicks and I'm going to put this behavior plan in place and we're going to see if he stops kicking. Well, instead, once I knew the why, then it was like, oh, OK, <laughs> so this these are the social skills that I help, need to help Joey with. So that's just one example of, you know, knowing the function of a behavior isn't enough. We need to know the message of the behavior and the why of what's happening. Um, so Mindy says, oh, BIP equals behavior intervention plan. Um, don't know if these were generated in other states as a result of an FBA. Thanks. Yeah, usually if a child has a BIP, which is the Behavior Intervention Plan, it's usually because they've done um, a functional behavior assessment and now they want to put a positive behavior plan in place. Tatiana is saying, yes, her son is just redoing, redoing, um, and just is worried 24-7. And so, Tatiana, that is, you know, it could be typical of kids on the spectrum where they're more of a perfectionist, and it's like, ah, I can't turn this in until it's perfect. Um, and that's something that the teachers need to be aware of. The aide that's helping him needs to be aware of. Um, and, you know, how we can help him understand um, that you can turn something in <laughs> that doesn't have to be perfect. Or sometimes what helps kids is if we um, let them do something on their computer and that, you know, if they make a mistake, that's easier to go back and fix, or they can use the spell checker and feel confident that everything is spelled right. Um, so sometimes using assistive technology can help the student um, get his assignment completed, feel good about it, feel like, yes, I, I can turn this in now. Um, so that would be one thing to look at is if they're allowing him to use his computer to get assignments done. Um, and Mindy asks, do you think FBA and behavior plan is an appropriate way to address issues such as STEMI, self-talk, et cetera, as with a autistic student? We have behavior plans for escape activities, obtain tangible escape attention. Um, great point about addressing the why behind these behaviors. So um, 
you know, Mindy, I think for some kids that are on the spectrum, that self-talk, that stimming behavior they have is something that they need. Um, and I think we as adults sometimes put value judgments on that and say, that's not appropriate. So, you know, you'll hear people say like quiet hands, hands down. And I, you know, I just come from the philosophy that I think we need to allow some of that for kids because that's how they're coping. That's how they're trying to re regulate the sensory information coming in. And so I wouldn't want my child to have a behavior plan to decrease self-talk or to decrease stimming. Um, instead, what I would want to do is say, you know, let's look at this as almost the why behind it is because they're trying to regulate their senses. Now, is there another way that we can make sure that they feel like their senses are regulated? You know, do we have a sensory diet written into the IEP or on the accommodation page? Um, are we giving him time to have those sensory breaks before he has a meltdown? Um, because what I've seen a lot of times is teachers will you know, kind of wait until the student has a meltdown. And then it's like, oh, we should give him a sensory break. And actually, that's not going to be as helpful as if we use sensory breaks as something that needs to be proactive, something that is regularly done throughout the school day um, to help them get regulated. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I have to leave the class and I have to go to the sensory room. I mean, it can be things like if your child needs that deep pressure, that proprioceptic input, it can be, you know, every day at 945, the teacher gives your child a stack of books that they have to carry down to the library. Or, you know, if your child just needs to get up and move, you know, hopefully the teacher allows that in their classroom. Um, if not, the teacher could give them a note and say, please take this to the office. Um, and on the note, it could be like, you know, so-and-so just needs a break. <laughs> He's bringing this note to you. Um, and the child has like an appropriate reason for getting up, walking down to the office, walking back. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I look at myself. I mean, when I'm sitting there working at the computer, a lot of times I'll have a paper clip and I'll be bending it back and forth. Now, nobody tells me, oh, Charmaine, you're stimming. Instead, I know that's, I just fiddle with things and that's part of what I do. Um, so I think often adults do some kind of stimming behavior. My husband and my son do a lot of self-talk. Um, and it's not like we're writing a behavior plan for that. It's like that's part of their personality, um, and we should accept that. Um, if your child, Mindy, has a behavior plan for a variety of things, like escaping, obtaining tangible, you know, gaining attention, again, we want to try and separate those out and see are there certain times of the day when they're trying to get more tangible rewards? Are there certain times of the day or certain classes that they're trying to get attention? How can we try to get those needs met in proactive, preventative ways versus letting it, you know, become such a big problem? Um, but yeah, I would talk to the IEP team and say, you know, we've got this behavior plan in place, but let's take a step back and Let's try to figure out why he's, you know, trying to do these things um, and get to that underlying message that your child may be showing. And so Jen says, um, I have often thought there's a great deal that goes on in the school day that can end up being non-preferred tasks for students with disabilities because those tasks are challenging. Um, the task challenging for typically developing students as well. You're right. Um, your emphasis on accommodations are being provided is important, 
because so often I find adults wrongly believe accommodations are a way of being easy on the student, allowing them to get out of work. Accommodations are about allowing the student to access their learning and they can't if they're frustrated or having a meltdown. And I totally agree um, with you, Jen, that, you know, sometimes people just have this perception that, um, you know, we're, if we give a child an accommodation, that's an easy way out. Um, and that, you know, some teachers are like, you know, no, the student can learn how to do this. And that's why it's really important, too, to make sure that all the general ed teachers, all the people that support your child at school know um, what accommodations they're supposed to be getting and to explain <laughs> that this is a way that your child can be successful. Um, and it's not to, like, let your child slide. But it's, you know, the whole concept of evening the, the playing field. Um, and some accommodations are we change how we present the information to the student. So if a student is a real visual learner, that we're not just giving all these auditory directions that are going to be confusing them. Sometimes accommodations are how your child's going to respond or show the teacher what they know. So again, if the teacher assigns, you know, your typical book report, everybody's got to, you know, answer these five questions and, you know, write a one page book report. And if handwriting is a challenge, um, if that's not your child's way, you know, of showing what they know, that we want teachers to have the accommodation that he can also, you know, do his book report through you know, an oral presentation to the class or through a PowerPoint. So some accommodations are how you present the information. Some accommodations are how your child shows what they know. They're still expected to know things and learn things, but they just will show you in a different way. And then the third major type of accommodations that we want teachers to have is how they engage kids, how they keep them motivated and interested in and doing, um, you know, learning at school. And those accommodations are not something that says, oh, he doesn't have to learn as much. That would be considered a modification. Um, but accommodations are something that just help. I mean, I, <laughs> when I drive, I have an accommodation. I use a GPS. I mean, if I don't have my GPS, it's like really challenging for me to get from point A to point B. So sometimes when you run into teachers that kind of have this negative attitude, then say, you know, as adults, I've noticed I have accommodations. I mean, I wear glasses and sometimes when I'm reading on the computer, I have to put my glasses on to see exactly what it is. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to get a free pass from getting out of work. It's just a matter of, you know, supports that's going to help me. So we're coming up on about our hour here. Um, and so <laughs> Venus says that I sound like Dr. Green and his lives in the balance. Um, yeah, if if you're not familiar with Ross Green, I would... Um, Google his name. There's articles he's written that you can get on the web um, or get some of his books. And, you know, basically what he tells us is, you know, kids will do what they can do. It's not like they're trying to, you know, make somebody upset or angry. They do the best that they can. Um, and so I really like Ross Green's philosophy and um, especially if your child has a behavior plan or has challenges in those areas, I would really encourage you to read the book and share with the teachers because it can be a really good switch of how to look at behavior in another um, vein. And Lisa says that um, they have one too, 
but a new FBA is being conducted this year. Um, so what you want to make sure, Lisa, is find out who's doing the FBA. Ask for some time either on the phone or face to face to actually sit down with that person and talk. Um, because so many times I hear from parents that, you know, they have no idea what's going on with the FBA and they've never been asked for input. And to me, a well-written FBA includes that input from the parent. Um, and to also make sure when they do about or observations that it's not just like one 20 minute observation in one classroom, but you talk to them. And these are things that you can set up before you sign the consent for a functional behavior assessment, because this is a, an assessment and they do need your consent. So, you know, if the teacher sends home a paper and it's marked, you know, they're going to do an FBA um, and they want you to sign it and return to school, I would say, no, <laughs> let's sit down and have a conversation. And I would have them write on that consent form exactly some of these things, like it's going to include a, you know, a face to face or phone call with the parent. It's going to include, you know, I don't know, you know, four or five observations in different settings at different times during the day and be really specific about the things that um, you want to make sure that is included in the FBA. So before you even give consent for it, there's an understanding and it's in writing what the FBA is going to consist of. So let me see here. Um, so Mindy says she didn't get it. So I think she's meaning she didn't get the matrix link and Mindy, I'll come back. I do have, um, an afternoon IEP meeting that I'm going to with, um, a family. So it might not be until this evening that I can come back and give you the link for the matrix, but for sure, I'll come back in and get that to you. And Tatiana says, what they say in the IEP, when I bring that up, they would say he is better in small groups and then where they suggest a separate environment, but that's not our goal. My son um, hates to be out of the classroom. And, you know, what, what um, I think Tatiana is like, this is really common that, you know, when we say we want our son to be, you know, taught with ways that he learns best. And one of the big rationales for pulling kids out is like, oh, you know, you want your son to learn how he learns best. Well, guess what? He learns best in a small group. Um, and sometimes they just say that without really having any evidence that he performs better in a small group. Um, and also, I'm going to put up here so I remind myself, there's a really good article from um, Julie Caston. She's a professor at Syracuse University. Um, and so I'm going to put this up here to remind myself. The other thing that I want to put in the link for you guys later tonight is this article that Julie did on um disagreeing with and showing through some of the observations that she's researched is that there's less learning when the student is pulled out in the special ed room um, than there is when they remain in the classroom. So Tatiana, that would be um, a good article for you to have. And I'll post that later tonight. Let me see if I missed any comments. Um, Jean says, yes, sensory breaks are supposed to be proactive. Not very helpful as the meltdown is happening. Exactly. And I you don't know why, <laughs> you know, sometimes that seems like a hard concept. But um, if you have a sensory diet in your IEP for your child as an accommodation, instead of just having the accommodation say sensory diet, um, I think it's more helpful if you can be specific um, 
if you know, you know, there's certain times of the day that's going to be helpful is to put those times in. Or, you you know, for some students, it's they need a sensory break before they do an activity that they're not very successful with or that they don't like very much. So if math is hard for them, for some students to take a sensory break before they have to sit down and do that math assignment is helpful. So in your accommodations, when you talk about sensory breaks, sensory diet, you want to have that accommodation be more specific. Um, and you want to make sure that they understand it's to be proactive. It's to be before the meltdown happens, right? So we're getting lots of good comments here. Thanks for being here, guys. Um, Tatiana says, yep, paper clips. My son came home with bandages from poking himself by accident. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. Uh, and, you know, some of us just like those kinds of fidgets. And um, as our kids get older, you know, we don't want, you know, necessarily a cush ball or something that looks real obvious. And so, you know, different things like a paper clip, but now we we'll have to figure out something without a sharp point, right, um, for your son. But those little things that they can have right at their desk, can be really helpful. And again, if your child has a behavior plan, those fidgets can be written in the behavior plan as far as preventative strategies. Or if your child doesn't have a behavior plan, but they still need those fidgets and it really helps calm them down, then make sure that that's um, included in the accommodations. And then what you have to do is make sure that the teachers allow your child to use the fidgets and um, know that that's, you know, written in the IEP that they need to implement that and um, follow through with that. Um, and Tatiana talks about, are there any quiet fidget toys that you recommend in the classroom? And um, so we can brainstorm about this, Tatiana. Um, and what you want to do is you want to figure out, like for some kids, they want a certain kind of texture. Um, and for some kids, it's like, eh, that texture is like really like, um, you know, like it just like bugs them. So that's not going to be a good thing. I mean, you, you know, for some kids, like a quiet thing is like silly putty or occupational therapists have. I forget what they call their, th their their putty, but you know it's just kind of a thick, almost clay kind of thing. And for some kids, just stretching that back and forth, it doesn't make any sound. It's also something they can do, kind of you know, small and you know, not feel like they're being that noticeable. Um, the other thing that I like to do with fidgets is to have an assortment of fidgets and let all the kids in the class decide if they want to go to get a fidget or when they want to get it or when they don't need it. Um, because I don't want to point out kids and say, oh, you need fidgets. Here's some fidgets for you. <coughs> Instead, you just say, you know, I know as a teacher, sometimes I like to hold my marker and, you know, click my pen off and on or whatever. And so I know as students, sometimes you guys like to do different things. We have a basket over here. When you walk into class, if you think you might want one, pick one up, keep it at your desk, and just make it kind of this nonchalant, like, you know, it helps all of us at certain times. Um, or, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily a fidget, but doodling. For some kids to sit there and doodle, you know, during a class lecture is going to actually help them pay attention more versus if they have to have their hands down and staring at the teacher the whole time. So these little things that you know about your child because you're their parent, you need to share with the staff and include that in the IEP so then they are accountable for making sure your child gets those um, accommodations. Um, and Mindy says that she hears about self-talk. He does get amped up and can sing or chant loudly. So sometimes does need a bit more of um, more support and proactive stuff to help him participate more with um, the inclusion group. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think we just want to help others, not only other adults, but other children know that, you know, we all learn differently. And, you know, for some of us, you know, humming or singing or something like that is going to be, you know, something that we do. The other thing that you could look at, Mindy, is maybe incorporating um, songs in chants for your child to learn new skills is going to be a way that he can learn that. And I don't know. I mean, it might just be a way for him to regulate and it's like, nah, that's not going to work really to teach him. But, you know, one of the things that I try to do is figure out what the child is showing me in the classroom and is there a way I can tap into that and use that as a, a strategy for when I'm teaching them new things. Oh, and Mindy has a great idea for Tatiana. She says, what about oral motor chewy necklaces and such? My kid doesn't gra gravitate to fidgets, but he likes chewies and wiggle seats. Yeah, so, you know, the OT can give you or the teacher one of these cushions that has bumps on it. For some kids, that works well. Um, for other kids, more of the ball chair instead of a regular chair where they get some input. Um, and again, if the teacher can have several of those in the classroom, so it's not like, oh, your son gets the wiggle seat or your son gets the, the ball chair. But, you know, really by having our children included in classrooms, it makes the teachers become better teachers because it's like, ooh, guess what? Not just this child does better, when he has a ball chair to sit on. But guess what? There's like three or four other kids in my class that do better. Um, and so sometimes when teachers think like, oh, this is an accommodation just for this one student, and I have so many other students I have to worry about. But no, if you give that option to other kids, believe me, there's probably more than just your son in the class that could use some type of sensory input or quiet fidgets for them to be more successful during the day. Um, and Terry says that she likes curriculum compacting as an accommodation. And for sure, this is really helpful that, um, you know, instead of looking at this broad area of all these things that we have to cover with our science book or whatever, if we can look at like, how can we bring that together and really compact it and um, still have the, the child learn the skills, but do it in a different way. So, um, you know, and sometimes you can also do this by, you know, if the child can show you that he has the math concepts by doing five problems, then why are we making him do 20 problems for homework? Um, so curriculum compacting can, um, can really help. Um, Tatiana, sa Tatiana says, thank you, Charmaine. I wish I knew you a few years ago. I know. And, you know, it's like we do the best we can with what we know. And so now we're learning new things. I'm always learning new things when I work with um, new families. So, yeah, it's that process. So, um just make sure that you give yourself credit because you're doing a wonderful job right now. And Mindy says, um, thank you also. Uh, Sharon would like the matrix. So if my bot isn't working and giving you that automatic uh, message, I'll come back after my IEP meeting and give you the link. Um, and Tatiana says that um, he does have chewing gum and a cushion seat. Uh, so yeah, so she says, thanks for reminding me about the seat. He's, it's not been used this year. So yeah, for sure. You want to make sure that they start using that again. So we've had a kind of jam packed, um, live show here. I just love the comments and questions and thank you for being here live. It makes it so much more meaningful when I can answer your exact questions, um, and so I hope if you have um, somebody recommending a behavior or functional behavior assessment that you will make sure that you um, share with the staff 
that the function is not enough, that we need to know what that underlying message is. So I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent, retired teacher, and advocate for families. You can always catch us live on Thursdays at noon Mountain Time. And we cover a variety of topics. And when you can be here with us live, it's just fabulous because we get to actually have conversations back and forth. So I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, as parents, I know you're doing an awesome job. And I just want to give you that encouragement that what you're doing is exactly what your child needs. And just to keep on keeping on. And until next Thursday, have a wonderful weekend and a great start to your week next week. And we shall see you then. Take care.